the Beatitudes are <clears throat> not actions, but are attitudes. It's part of our life. It's part of our being. Be a kind of person. Be a Christian. Be a follower of Christ. Is the, 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 the attitude of our heart. Is it the, the, the attitude of our soul reflects, reflecting and, 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 and showing the image of God, the image of Jesus in our life. So we need, of course, in order to put in practice these Beatitudes, the cross of Jesus, the life of Jesus, the sacrifice of Jesus in us. Because the Beatitudes, they, are, they, they come from heaven. They are not from us. We cannot develop. We cannot create it. It's in the DNA that God gave to all those who believe and to want to enter into his kingdom. We must bore again in order to see God. We must bore again in order to pursue or to be peacemakers. We must bore again to let other people in some way influence in our life, but we in control of our power, in control of our rights, in control of what we can do and we cannot do, we let sometimes other people take advantage of, of that. Doesn't mean that we are no strong. Doesn't mean that our God is no strong. It means that we are just letting them go, letting them do it, in order to achieve a bigger and better plan that God has for us. Now, <clears throat> starting in this Beatitudes these days here in CN, we have a challenge to go in the process of become more like Christ. We shall be like him, said the Bible. And one day we will, like, we will be like him. In heaven, we're definitely going to be like Jesus. Everything will be in, in, in the presence of God. Everybody will be in the presence of God as new creation. We'll be like Jesus in, in a glorious way. We will have a glorious body, a glorious life. We will be like him. But we in earth have to go in this uh, steps of growing and become more like him. Like we are ascending to heaven. We are approaching to the day that we'll be with Jesus forever. And we'll be like him. Perfect. In purity. In holiness. And we'll be in the holy celestial city with our king, with our God, with our Lord, with our Savior, with the lover of our soul, Jesus Christ. How we do that? As we recognize that we are poor in the spirit, in need, spiritual bankrupt, definitely without any help, any support that we can claim to God for his help. We can claim God for his rescue. We can claim God for his mercy. And now walk into his presence with fear, with humble hearts, mourning for our sinful nature, mourning for no be yet like him, mourning for, for no make any effort to change, to be transformed. It doesn't mean that we are perfect now. It doesn't mean that we should be perfect now, but it means that we have to try with all our heart, with all our strength, to fight a good fight of faith. Not just beating the air, like say the Apostle Paul, but, but beating the devil, the, the sinfulness of our life with boldly faith, with the sword of the Spirit that is the Word of God, with conviction that we are walking truth, the golden gates of heaven, with one day, where one, one day we'll be with God forever. So in this process of becoming more like him, now we have to learn that we have to be like Jesus, meek. Because blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth, says the Lord. So in this process of being like him, we are climbing up to his presence. We are climbing up like a, a, a climber, a, a person who are, who are trying to climb a mountain. Some theologians, they try to understand these Beatitudes as they are climbing up in the process of being more like Jesus. Some of the theologians that they try to illustrate these Beatitudes, they say like, yes, going up to the Mount of God, the Mount of Zion, as you used to say, the place of holiness, the presence of God, is a long process or is a process of going into the steps to become more like Jesus. It doesn't happen automatically. It doesn't, you don't become like Jesus just because you pray and say, Jesus, I accept you as my Lord and Savior. Many people are actually, 
disappointing of their say that after they asked Jesus for salvation, they said, I I'm still a feel like a sinner. I still feel like I didn't have salvation. Maybe I didn't have enough faith to be saved. Maybe I'm not yet born again. But if we see the teachings of Jesus, he, when he asks us to be poor in the spirit, he wanted the people to admit the lacking of the spiritual power, the spiritual presence of God, the lacking of the presence and power of the Holy Spirit in our life, God's spirit. So it's a, it's a pursuing of, of faith, seeking faith. Jesus said, seek, knock, and ask, and he will give it to you. So if you are knocking the doors of heaven, you are seeking for a Savior, and you call for salvation, God will grant it you. God will grant it you. He already demonstrated, and he already said and announced it to the world that he wants to give us freely salvation. Then, as we continue living this life of faith, then we repent for our sins. We mourn for our sins. And as today we want to see these Beatitudes, we also submit our life to Christ. We obey His commandments. We look for His blessing as we become obedient to His will. Then we will become thirsty and hungry for His Spirit every day as we need more and more of Him. The process of sanctification is to recognize that mercy needed to our life because we cannot make holy ourselves. We cannot become holy for more by our own efforts. It needs to be the mercy of God who will ministry holiness to all of us. A pure heart so we can see her. We can see God. We can see His words. We can see His blessing. We can see His favor in our life. And to share the gospel as peacemakers. So we can go with the shoes or the sandals of peace in the armor of God to proclaim the good news because those feet are blessed who carry the good news to all the nations and endure persecution when we stand for our rights, when we stand for the kingdom of God and we have to fight with the eternal Apollyon who always try to defeat the Christians in this world to deny that Christ is the Lord of their life. So in this process of climbing out to the kingdom of heaven, we need to work on these realities in our life. It is not easy. It is not in instantaneous. We cannot have like these three minutes spiritual oven, microwave. So we can have, okay, give me the realities, God, now. I just give you three minutes for this, three minutes of prayer. And we just put our hearts into this spiritual microwave and then we just try to get it back with all the Beatitudes on it. It doesn't work like that. Blessed are the meek for they shall inherit the earth. They shall receive the earth. How? How does it work? How we people who like Jesus are meek we receive the, the earth. We inherit the earth. Actually in the book of Deuteronomy the Bible says in Deuteronomy 28 verse 1 if you fully obey the Lord your God and carefully follow all his commands, I give you today the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations of the earth. In other words, if we are becoming more like Jesus and we becoming meek like him, we will inherit the earth. As we obey, if we fully obey his commandment, God will put in above all the nations of the earth. All that we need and we ask, we will give it to us in prayer, in petitions, in requests, because God will grant us everything if we are in obedience to Him. How much He will give us this world? He said to, one, to David in one of his Psalms, and this is the Messianic Psalms, sit next to me until I will put all your enemies for platform of your feet. In other words, when Jesus resurrected from the dead and ascended to heaven, he sat at the right hand of God the Father, and he put in above all the world, above all authority, above all dominions, above all the earth, the universe. 
But the Bible said in Ephesians chapter 2 that by faith we are seated with Jesus in heaven. So if we are sitting with Jesus in heaven, and as Jesus is interceding for all humanity at the right hand of God, and we with him are praying and interceding with Jesus at the right hand of God in heaven, we have all the war under our feet. We already have inert the earth. And we can have all the war if we have confidence to pray for the nations. This war, meek, it's a word that you don't use in English frequently, even for native speakers. No more for us. We are no native speakers living here in Korea. So, I mean, I mean let, me, let me ask you, how many times you use this vocabulary, this word meek, the last week? Probably no. But the word meek in the dictionary means gentle, quiet, easily imposed, submissive. Also, they have synonyms like uh, obedient, uh, tame, uh, humble, timid, uh, like a lamb to the slugger, and, and other more. But in the biblical dictionary, the word meek in Greek is prius. This word prius in Greek means meek, means humble, and means gentle. But the meaning of this word in this context, it means strength under control. The word praise that comes from the root pra praos means straight under control. And this is the word that Greek people were using in, in those days to define the, 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 the strength that a wild animal have when it, be, when it becomes a domestic animal, like a horse, like a stallion, who was fine in the nature and, and wild and strong and beautiful. But then after his training and domaining by his master becomes a useful instrument for the honor. It's a strength under control. We all have a strength. As we say this morning to the kids, the joy of the Lord is our strength. We have a strength because we are saved. And God gave us this strength. The Bible said that he gave us power so we can be his witness to the end of the year. Starting from Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and here in Korea today. We have the power of the Holy Spirit. We have the strength. But this strength is under control. The control of God. We have to put our strength, our power under the control of God. So we have to understand that meek doesn't mean that we are weak. As famous uh, philosopher said, being meek does not make me weak or weakness. But it does mean behaving with goodness and kindness, showing strength, sincerity, healthy, self worth and self-control. Meek doesn't mean weak. It means power under control, like a gentle person. But we are not talking about weak, uh, meekness as, as a natural talent or, or behavior that we are born with. Because anybody here, and nobody in the future, nor your children that you have in the future, we will born meek. Nobody was born meek. Maybe Jesus. But none of us. I cannot say that my two kids, they are, they are born meek. We by nature, we are not meek. It is God who gave us this ability, this opportunity, this power to become meek. So it's not our power, it's God's power. Now it's God's power in control. In cooperation with us and the Holy Spirit in harmony to be one in Christ that we can use this power and put it under control, under submission of God. Warren Worsby in his book, The Beatitudes, he will say, meekness is the right use of power and wisdom is the right use of knowledge. They go together. The truly wise person will show in his daily life, conversation means behavior, that he is a child of God. Attitude and actions go together. The attitude to be meek, the actions to put in control our strength. Be strong, but no root, 
Be kind, but not weak. Be bold, but not bully. Be humble, but not timid. Be proud, but not arrogant. Power under control. Power under control. Once again, this is not from us. It's a fruit. The fruit of the Spirit. Actually, the same word that was used for this beatitude is the same word that is used in the fruit of the spirits, as the Paul Paul used it in Corinthians. He said, gentleness is one of the fruit of the Spirit. So this word gentleness is the same word for meek in the Beatitudes. Now, nothing is as strong as gentleness and nothing so gentle as the real strength. A person who has the fruit of the Spirit, they know the power that they have. They know that they can be gentle as a fruit of the Spirit. But once again, this is not easy. And I try to minister myself with this sermon. Because I'm not gentle. I'm not meek. I cannot control my power. And you can ask to my wife. She's my witness. And many times when I don't have control, she says, how dare you can be a pastor. But yes, it's true. We are not born meek. But we can ask God to help us to use his power in the right way. So it's like you have to put God <laughs> in front of you and say, okay, God, who has more power here? Who is the stronger here? Me or you? Because meanness is acknowledge that this power doesn't come from you. You are not elevating yourself because you have powers. You are elevated because God elevates you. Like you see in this play of CISO, when I play with my kids, they love CISO. And they love the, the moment when I strongly try to jump on this, on this table and go to the bottom, to the ground, and they immediately are lifted up. And when they feel this strength that my, head, my, my, my weight hit the ground, they boom. Jump on the earth. They love that. They love the moment that when they are boom and boom, boom, and they laugh at that, especially the second one. When I see my kids in, in, the, in, the, in this game, in this playground, I say, yeah, they love to have my energy, my power to lift them up. They feel strong. They feel confident. They, they feel that they can touch the sky. But this energy doesn't come from them. They're weak. They're light. It is I who is heavy. We have the energy. In the same way, it is God who elevates us, who promotes us. It is God who, who gives us the air as inheritance. It's not us. It's not our own power. It's not our own effort to try to conquer this world. To try to take this world. We can have a vision and say, yes, God, give me all the nations of the world. Prosper my business. Help me my studies. I want to to go farther. But it's not your strength, it's the strength of God. It's the power of God in you. You may ask God, God, I'm just going to put my feet on this platform, but I gently, humbly, want to pray to you to borrow your power so you can give me all the nations. Europe, America, Oceania, Africa. Whatever you plan to do for His glory, for letting his kingdom come, he will let you have all this war as an inheritance. Do you want to have a vision for your future? You don't know what to do? Then try to be a global leader. Try to be, with your studies, you want to be a doctor, engineer, whatever you want to do, designer. Think about what is your dominion? What do we try to dominate? You just think, okay, I want to be like many people in this world. A doctor or an engineer or a teacher because I just want to have a car, an apartment, and a good salary every month with vacation every year. You will have it. But that's your power. That's your power. And you will have it until you die and go to a grave, to the grave. That's all that you will have. You can pursue for that. Everybody can do that. Christians are not Christian. But if you want to let God's kingdom be established in this world, and you want that God use your career, your company, your life, your family as an instrument of standing his kingdom, then God will give you this vision. 
to inherit the world, the earth. You want to be a missionary? Then you can ask God. But the first thing is that you have to be in submission to God, into, in submission to His power, to change your life first, to transform your lives and to become more like Him. So you can learn from Him. You can be a witness to the heirs of the earth. Jesus said, if you are heavy labor, if you are tired of your life, if you are tired of, of everything that you try until now, why don't you take my job? Why don't you take my cross? Why don't you take my life and learn from me? For I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for yourself. If you want to be blessed, take Jesus cross, take Jesus' commandment, take Jesus' life to you, and let Jesus bless you as He wanted to bless you. But you cannot do that until you put the cross of Jesus in your heart, in your mind, in your soul, as your banner for living this world. Why? Because once again, we think that we try to get everything with our own effort, with our own power. Our own power. When Jesus was speaking the, and teaching these Beatitudes, He was speaking to the Israel people, knowing that He had these three audiences in in, in, in among of Him. To those who were listening to Jesus, they, Jesus knew that they were, as I say already, two weeks ago and last week. They were the Zealots, the Sadducees, and the Pharisees. And the Zealots, they tried to get power by taking power. They try to be happy by taking everything by force. They say, we're going to inherit the earth, we're going to inherit the lands by force. Taking force. The Sadducees, they say, oh, we're going to take the whole war, just enjoying the whole war. No consequences, no regrets. Let's be friends with the, the Romans, let's be friends with the Gentiles, let's do whatever we want. There's no consequences. There's no good and evil. They just leave the moment. Enjoy. This air is everything that we have. No heaven, no hell. Those were the Sadducees. And then there were the Pharisees. The Pharisees, they say, let's go back to the tradition. Let's go back to the tradition. So if we're going to inherit the land, if we're going to have the promised land again, and God use us as a powerful nation, let's go back to the traditions. Let's keep the, the, the law. And the, let, let's, let's become children of Moses, children of Abraham. And they didn't recognize the Messiah who were in front of them, who wants to give them the whole war. They were just keeping this land of Israel for them. God was there offering the whole war, inherit the heirs, but they just want to keep the tradition to only be happy with the portion of land that they have. They didn't see the big picture. They didn't see the vision of God that they have for Israel. They were selfishly centering on their, in their own life, their own ways. Traditionalists always try to not change everything. The it, utopians, they want to just leave the moment. And the others who want to take power by their own hands. Today we have the same kind of people. But for those who were there, Jesus forgive them all. Jesus is the meekest person in the Bible. He, when he was in front of Pontius Pilate, he was in front of the authority and he had the power to call for a legion of angels to defeat the Romans. But he didn't use his power. He just remained quiet, like a sheep who is going to be slaughtered. And he just said to Pontius Pilate, my kingdom is not from this world. You have no authority or power over me that is not given from above. So your power that you have for me is not yours. It has been given to you. And when they were crucifying him, they were mocking at Jesus and saying, Hey, if you are the Messiah, the Son of God, why you don't come back, come down, and save yourself, and save us all, and then we will believe in you. They were mocking the creator of the universe. They were mocking the ones who could save them. And Jesus, instead to, to be angry and use his power, he, as a meek person, the meekest person in this world, he just said, Father, forgive them. Because they don't know what they're doing. What image? What picture of meekness? What picture of humbleness? What picture of gentleness? In the Bible, we have many characters that give us example of to be meek. In the Old Testament, Joseph, he was 
a person who was elevated to the position of Pharaoh. He had all the power to inherit now the land. He was in charge of everything. The whole world was in his hand. And the whole world came to him to ask for food. And with them, his brothers. And when Joseph saw his brother, he didn't took this power to revenge against his brothers. As a meek person, he forgave them, picked them, and gave them another opportunity. This is power under control. What Joseph received, he inherited the world in his time. Moses, the Bible says he was the most humble person in the, in, in, in the Bible. He, he had the power to make miracles. He opened the seas with prayer and, and, and let water come from the rock. But when the, the others, the Israelites, and even their family members insult him, he just remained quiet. And this passage in Exodus is, it happened when his own sister, Miriam, he was talking against Moses because he had a different, another wife. God punished Miriam and declared Moses is the most humble, meekest person in the world in his time. David could defeat Goliath, who had the power to, to kill 200 Philistines just to get married with the daughter of Saul, the king. When Saul tried to kill him, he didn't use his power, his abilities, and his training as a soldier to give him back a strike. He just ran away. He just let it happen. And he just wait until the time that he lifted up to be the king of his nation. Do you want to be lifted up? Do you want to God give you this word and inheritance to have favor among people, nations, cultures? business, everything that this world can offer you, do you want to be on the top of them? You must be a meek person. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. The promise of having a new heaven, a new earth, come from the old prophecies. In Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 11 and 12, the Bible said, On that day you will not be put to shame for all the wrongs you have done to me, because... I will remove from this city those who rejoice in their pride. Never again will you be gently on my holy hill, but I will live with you, the meek and humble who trust in the name of the Lord. In other words, is your life suffering? Is your family suffering? Is your business suffering? Is your city suffering? Is your country suffering? You have the promise of God. If you are meek, humble and gentle, God will keep you as a remnant. And others like you will become a remnant. And when the pride of this world will be under the judge of God, only you and those who remain faithful to God, more like, becoming more like Him, every day will possess this new air and new heaven that we'll receive when the Lord comes again to take his church. Let's pray.